high point in the romance of Bob and Mary. For them, the future looks bright. Bob's mother and Mary's parents are confident too that the marriage will succeed because it's based on many things, companionship, mutual interests, shared ambitions, and that mysterious intangible quality which we call love. And part of this love is their relationship to one another as man and woman. For Mary, good sex adjustment began when she was a very small child. Where is the baby, Mommy? Why won't it come? It's right here, dear. Of course, it doesn't talk yet or cry or even eat by itself. It has to stay inside me till it's big and strong enough to be born. When it comes, Mommy, can I help to take care of it? Yes, dear. The idea of childbirth was made natural and normal for Mary. She was happy to know that she would have a new baby sister or brother. Bob's mother was a widow. In spite of this, she was determined that her son should have a proper knowledge of sex from the beginning. She answered all his questions. If no questions came, she arranged situations so that he became conscious of sex. When he was little, Bob and his mother were always together, and they had a wonderful time. As he grew older, she made sure that he played with other children, both boys and girls. And when he was older still, she was pleased and proud that he seemed to fit in well with the boys. In fact, when he was about 10, he actually scoffed at playing with girls. Mary, too, had a normal childhood, with many friends of both sexes. But as the time for Mary's first menstrual period approached, her mother explained about the changes that would take place, instead of leaving her to pick up odd bits of startling and inaccurate information from her schoolmates. Mary's father and mother got along well. They had their occasional quarrels, but in general, home life was pleasant, natural, and secure. Hi, Duchess. Hi. At about 11, Mary went through a sort of reversal. She didn't talk much and spent hours alone, just daydreaming. What's the matter with her? Oh, she's just growing up, dear. Well, hadn't you better have a talk with her? Well, yes, dear, but I don't think this is the time. When she wants to ask questions, I'll try to be ready with the answers. Mary's mother tried to discuss sex without embarrassment and to give Mary facts without prejudice or any suggestion of fear or shame. At about 12 and a half, Mary reached puberty. Around this time, she found that her friends wanted to talk she about sex. She opened the door and there she was lying in bed. <laughs> Some of them got most of their information from off-color jokes that they really didn't understand. But you don't always have a baby when you go over time. I read in a book that you don't have a baby. Some of them learned about sex from books. But there were so many things that they didn't know. Did you um, marry your first cousin? Do you have a deformed baby? Does kissing have anything to do, I mean, about having babies? Are you afraid of having a baby, Mary? No, I'm not. Because, after all, people have been having babies for thousands of years. And nowadays, doctors have so many ways of making it safe. Mother says... For Mary, the fulfillment of a healthy sex life held no fears. Sex was not something sinister to be whispered about, but it was a natural function which could contribute to the ultimate happiness of home and a family. About this time, Mary developed a sudden, strong friendship with Lucille Williams. It seemed that Mary could talk better with Lucille than with anybody. They had absolutely no secrets from each other. They were inseparable. To Mary's mother, it seemed unnatural, this continual intimacy, this concentration of affection on one not very unusual girl. Oh, Lucille, wait a minute. Ethel, we forgot. 
forgot about Ethel. We're going to have to bring her. Oh, Ethel. we don't have to bring her. You know what she's like with boys and everything. Mary, darling, you're keeping Lucille from her dinner. Oh, I was just leaving Mrs. Gibbs. Well, bye. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, then. Bye. Bye. Mother forgets the devotion she had for her own girlfriend about 25 years ago. Next, there was a crush on Ethel Hampton, senior girls' tennis champion. Mary seemed to have a real need to be stirred up about someone. It was a transition stage from the antagonism toward boys just before puberty to the next stage of falling in love with a boy. Soon, she reached that stage. Her next crush was on the captain of a school football team. She spent hours trying to make herself more attractive, imagining herself in all sorts of romantic situations. It might be a boy. No, but it's going to be about a boy. John's going to ask him. He pretty nearly did today. He owns a class bell ring. Yeah. Oh, he is creamy. But it's both going to go, too. I don't know where... Bob was growing up, too. He knew about the reproductive organs and nocturnal emissions. He also knew about masturbation. But he'd read that the problem was more mental than physical. He knew that the healthiest life for him was to have plenty of exercise and fresh air. He liked football, and the coach was a hero who could do no wrong. Bob tried to be as much like him as he could. His interests were mainly masculine, and his success at sports made him sure of himself. He could take girls in his stride, just as he did games. Until one day, when Bob was 16, it became apparent that his interest in girls was getting to be more than casual. She's okay, but I can do better than her, Kenny. She's going around with Dave anyway. Well, let him keep her. Well, sure I could. I just didn't want to. Well, so what? I've got better prospects than her, too. You should see the one I'm taking tonight. Sure, that's the one, Elsie. What a doll. Her old man's got a car. Let's they use it every Friday. I'm uh, taking her down to Slip's Pond tonight. We might go in for a little swim. Hello? No, he isn't. Is this Betty? Oh, Jane. Well, no. I beg your pardon. Well, no, Hazel, he isn't in and... No. No, I don't know where he was going. He didn't say. Not to me, anyway. Girls, girls, girls. Dates every night. She was worried. Perhaps his behavior was normal, but it was not to her liking. How could you get him more interested in his schoolwork? Mary and her gang were going through the hangout stage. They like to be in a crowd. When you're not sure how to act or what to say, you can hide your confusion in the general hubbub. A girl has to look as though she knew her way around, be more sophisticated than she really is. It was all new and exciting, and Mary was proud of her success. She wanted the others to see how popular she was. 
Hi, Barry. How about going to the dance with me Saturday night? Well, I'll think about it. Hey, wait a minute. What about me? You didn't ask me. Well, I was going to. But you didn't, though. Jim got there yeah. first. Okay, Jim. Good. See you around. A little popularity gives one self-confidence, which isn't a bad thing in moderation. I don't even know that one's name. Alan, I'm worried about her. She's getting so silly over the boys. You should hear her on the phone. I have. But what worries me even more is the way she goes out dancing at these juke joints. She's got nothing in her head but boys, boys, boys. She's only out Friday and Saturday night. But I'm afraid she might make a little fool of herself. And I can't keep saying don't all the time. There's no use saying don't to Mary. It makes her worse. Isn't there any positive approach to this business of sex education? She knows the physical facts. But that alone doesn't give her a healthy attitude to boys. I'll have to talk more to her about how to have fun with them without being silly. Well, I guess she'll just have to learn by experience how to look after herself. And Mary was learning by experience. She acquired a lot of social skills and graces. She learned how other people are likely to react to different situations. She learned about herself. And by going with a lot of boys, she found out what kind of boy she really liked most. And her mother tried to help her develop sound judgment about boys, not to be influenced by superficial glamour or the opinions of others. Because her mother never seemed shocked, Mary talked freely with her. By 16 and a half, Mary had settled down to go steady with one boy, George Palmer, who was in her class at school. He wasn't her ideal, but she liked going steady because it meant that she was always sure of having a date and she never felt left out and unpopular. Her parents thought George was a nice boy and they were glad to know who Mary was out with at first. But after several months, her mother began to be afraid that the affair was becoming too serious. Actually, Mary and George we're at the point of breaking up anyway. Of him, Mary. But I've told you, he's just a date. Can I have dates if boys want to take me out? Boy, yes. But is it always going to be George? It could get to be that way, you know. And I just don't think George is the one for you. Okay, Mother, if that's the way you feel about it, I won't see him anymore. Now, will you please leave me alone? Bob's mother was having her troubles, too. Mmm, pretty snazzy. Just getting fixed up a little. Who is the lucky girl tonight? Do I have to turn in a written report? Bob, I don't mean to be nosy, but if it's Marion again, she just isn't the kind of girl I like to have you going out with. Look, Mom, it's me that's going out with her, isn't it? And I think she's okay. Just because you're a bridge club and some of those other old dames run her down doesn't We're mean We're not old dames. I don't mean you. You know better than that. And we don't run her down. Okay, so you don't. But I pick the girls I take out, don't I? Yes. I guess you do. Good night, Mom. It 
seemed as though all the planning and guidance since he was a child had been a waste of time. Bob was going with a fast crowd. And like most teenagers, he wanted to be one of the gang. Go as far or farther than anyone else did. His mother didn't know what to do. If she said anything, he just became more secretive and defended his friends against her old-fashioned morals, as he called them. She felt that somehow she had failed in his training. In the meantime, Mary had a new steady, Stanley Brooks. He had a good disposition, intelligence, reasonable good looks. He came closer to her ideal than George had. In fact, she thought this might be the real thing. Mary senses that her mother approves of Stan, and this encourages her to talk to her about him. But not long after, Stan's family moved away. And that was that. When a girl loses a steady, it takes a little while to get back in circulation. But if you want to meet boys, you go where boys are. Mary had a cheerful disposition, she was intelligent, healthy, and attractive, and she had no trouble making friends. Jack Arnold was one of the gang she had known for years. He suddenly became interested, and interesting. It seemed for a while to be romance with a capital R. like an iceberg all your life. Look, we love each other, don't we? Yes, but after all... After all what? Take me home! Now Mary began to realize what her mother had meant all these years. Through her own experience, Mary was developing a sound ideal of what love should mean in her life. It was not what Jack offered. A change is coming over Bob, too. Come on, Jeannie. Time I was getting you home. Oh, why? It's early. Work, Jeannie. Work. I've got exams coming up in the morning. What a party pooper. Bob had been to plenty of wild parties. It wasn't so excitingly new anymore. And life was full of other interesting things. He had a career to think of. He began to stay at home more. This engineering stuff really takes slugging. You're going to lose out with your girlfriend. Don't worry. I won't. He still enjoyed parties. He still took out girls, a different one every week. But his perspective had changed. The desperate rush to find out all about sex was over. In his case, too, early training was taking on new meaning through personal experience. Mary had broken off with Jack, and by chance she turned up at the same party as Bob. When they met that first night, both had a pretty good idea of the kind of people they really liked. It didn't seem much different from other dates at first, but after a few weeks, both knew that it was different. Petting was not just a form of entertainment or an experiment. There was real affection and mutual respect. More and more, they found in each other the things they were looking for. Being together heightened the enjoyment of everything they did. They tried to be together all the time. They had their quarrels, mostly over jealousy. But each time, they knew from the beginning they'd make up. They both had a good sense of humor. They both enjoyed doing the same things. Because of similar family and educational background, 
they had much the same way of looking at things. They began to know that this time it was for keeps. They were so sure that their love was deep and spiritual that at times a marriage ceremony seemed to be just a formality. Love seemed to be all that really mattered. But each of them knew deep down that they wanted their marriage vows to have real meaning. Bob and Mary had a healthy attitude toward one another as man and woman that was built up step by step since childhood. First, each of them learned the biological facts of sex as soon as they were able to understand them. Second, they learned about the other sex from their own experience. Thirdly, their parents tried to help them understand the real values of sex life. And finally, long after reaching physical maturity, they became emotionally independent of family apron strings. Now, they're on their own. Do you believe their parents have done the best they could to help Mary and Bob make all these adjustments? Are Mary and Bob typical of our teenagers? Have they a sound background for marriage? What do you think?